good morning, everybody. So back in, um, or let me back up a little bit. So um, the beginning of the month, each month, we be, uh, begin to put out new resources for you guys. We have a resource table kind of on your way out the door on the right. It says resource on it. And uh, you guys, on that table, there's all kinds of resources that we put together for you guys. Each month, we, uh, we put out a Bible reading plan. You can pick up a Bible reading plan. Uh, if you like the paper version, some people like to be able to just cross it off their list. Some people like to go online. You can go online and get the Bible reading plan. We've also got a new magazine that we've uh, started to subscribe for you guys uh, called The Lookout. Uh, it's a, just a little couple-page magazine uh, they provide for us each week. You guys can find that in the little carousel. Uh, if you're looking for something a little bit deeper than that, there's one called The Christian Standard. You're more than welcome to take those as well. But that resource table is there for you guys. It's just a great opportunity uh, to find resources. There's a book on how to pray and different types of prayer. There's uh, a, a daily devotional book called Daily Bread. There's all kinds of things on that table that's for you. So as you're going out the door every week, make sure you guys are checking that table out. Pick up a Lookout copy or Christian Standard. Standard and, and read those. Uh, they're all there for you. And I, and I just like to point that out. Usually the beginning of the month is always a good time because we're producing new Bible reading plans. They're there for you all as well. Um, so we're, we're kicking off a new series called You Asked For It. And uh, if you remember back at Easter, uh, we produced a survey for you guys uh, asking you what, what do you guys want to hear about? Maybe there's stuff that we're not talking about uh, in our preaching calendar that you guys want to know about. You know, when I sit down, uh, usually during the summer, uh, to put together uh, about 12 months worth of preaching uh, topics, you know, it's just a, it's a very one-sided, well, two, it's me and God. So, I mean, we're just, we're working it out. You know, and Matt gets added into that conversation. Now it's three people. Uh, but what about you guys? I mean, what are you guys wanting to hear about that we're not talking about? And so uh, we uh, took that survey, we pulled together all the data and the resources, and we produced four sermons that we're going to talk about, like purpose and simplification, forgiveness, a change. How, how do we change? So we're going to be talking about those things. Um, but one of the things I noticed was there were questions that are asked that maybe uh, you weren't like, wasn't on the top of your list, but you wanted to know about. Or uh, there was something that, so, that a few people asked for, so didn't make the list, but it's really worth our while to sit and talk about it or to think about it. And so... Um, as we're kind of getting back into the rhythm of things uh, for the fall, you know, each week I, I, I write you guys an email. If you're not getting that email, make sure your Connect card has our, your email address on it. We'll put you on the list. Uh, but we, I want to, uh, you know, as I'm talking through those emails and whatnot, I want to put together a little resource for you about a topic. Like, uh, you know, one of the topics that we're not going to get a chance to talk about this uh, four weeks is marriage. But marriage was one that some people had asked about. So in last week's email, I put a couple of uh, articles about marriage, about godly marriage. And what does that look like? And, and so that's there for you guys. So each week we're going to put together a couple of little resources for you dealing with some of the ones that didn't get talked about or didn't get uh, put on our list. Uh, but we are talking about questions that you asked for. You know, I, I was thinking about how accident prone I was as a kid, right? And most of us as kids were just accident prone. We don't think about the consequences of our actions, right? I mean, we just do. We want to have fun or we just want to go down this way and we want to do this thing. But what are the, the repercussions uh, on the other side of it, the accidents? You know, I talk with my kids about that and they'll, they'll start to do something and I'll go, wait a second, you know, what's going to happen? Happen on the other side of this? Is there going to be an accident that occurs on the other side of this? Well, dad, I, 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 I'm not really thinking about that. Like, I, I don't really care about that. I was like, I know that's why they're called accidents because you didn't plan for them. And I think in life, we can accidentally go through life. I think we can walk through this life day after day with no plan. We're not purposefully creating steps for today and for tomorrow. We don't have goals. We don't have a purpose. We don't have a reason for the things that we do, and, and it just happens. We walk through this life. We guide through this life. Maybe we even go to the end of our lives not really having feeling like we have a purpose. Life is the decisions that we make and purpose only, only happens because we pursue it to get there. We have a plan. We have a, a purpose. 
And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And, and you know, as we're, we're jumping in, you guys can go ahead and turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37. We're going to sit and camp at and look at the life of Joseph as we're talking about purpose this morning. But as you guys are turning your Bibles, I want to ask you a question. This is the question of the day. And just turn to the people closest to you, and I want you to answer this question. Why do you think you are on this earth for? What's your purpose? Why do you think you are on this earth for? Take just two minutes, turn to the people closest to you, answer that question, and we're going to get right back together. We could sit around and talk about what on earth are we here for all day. I think it's a question that a lot of us ask, and I don't think it's one that we spend a lot of time with. I don't really, you know, I think that we sit down and ponder what are we here for? What is my, my purpose? And how am I getting from what I think my purpose is to, you know, where I am today to that purpose? And that's this morning we want to talk about that. I want to look at the life of Joseph Joseph was an Old Testament, uh, uh, you know, just one of the guys that lived in the Old Testament. But his story is so profound because I think it's, it's one that, that so many of us identify with. Minus the whole being sold into slavery part. Like I think a lot of us, you know, will identify with the life of Joseph. Joseph, uh, it, it introduces, you begin to see uh, he's a son of Jacob. He is the son uh, he, of his favorite wife, which is kind of weird for us to talk about. Like I only have one wife, so I can only have one favorite wife. He had multiple wives. So he had a favorite, and uh, and Rachel was Rachel was the love of his life, and that was his favorite wife. And so Joseph is his firstborn to Rachel, and, and so so you get a lot of, of the po- story pointed onto Joseph as it moves out of Jacob and on onto Joseph. Joseph is the one we talk about. Remember Joseph in the Technicolor coat, right? And 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 he has these these dreams, these visions, and his brothers hated him for these dreams and these visions that he had. You know, because he's a young guy, he's probably in his late teens as he's having these dreams. He's immature, he's kind of boastful, and he's like, yeah, you guys are going to be bound down to me. You know, and can you, you know, you imagine how a young guy would say this real boastfully, like, you guys are going to be bound down to me. He's like, we are going to show you what it looks like to bow down. And, and so he has these dreams because God is, is preparing him for something great. And they begin to show him and his family what God's about to do and the work, not only uh, as he's working through the life of Jacob and the life of Joseph, but eventually setting up the people of Israel uh, in the land of Egypt. And so Genesis chapter 37 starts this way. Uh, his brothers are mad at him, and this is what happens. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off his beautiful robe that he was wearing. They grabbed him, and they threw him into a cistern. Now the cistern was empty, and there was no water in it. Then, just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming towards them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders uh, taking a load of gum and balm and aromatic, aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judah, that's one of the brothers, said to his brothers, What will we gain by killing our brothers? We'd have to cover up our crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood, and all the brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, uh, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brother pulled him out of the cistern and sold him for 20 pieces of silver, uh, and the traders took him down to Egypt. Here's a boy who has these amazing dreams, these amazing visions, and now seemingly they're coming crashing to an end because he's been sold into slavery. The people that he thought loved him the most, the people that he, that he would have trusted the most, his own brothers have sold him out and sold him into slavery. And you can begin to imagine what goes through his mind. And we think about those things when, when bad things happen to us. What are the things that go through our minds? When we begin to question, why is this happening, God? God, where are you? It's one of the things that we'll, we're going to see through the life of Joseph um, is his, his trusting God just grows and grows and grows through these situations. As to, after he's sold into slavery, uh, the Ishmaelites take him down to Egypt, and he's sold to a wealthy man named Potiphar. If you remember the story, Potiphar uh, takes him into his home, sees how capable he is. 
He's a very a strong leader, and he's able to uh, just really take control of situations. And so he puts him over his entire household. And that's what it says in chapter 39, starting in verse 6. says, So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything that he owned. And with, jo- uh, with Joseph there, he didn't have to worry about anything except what he was going to eat. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man, and Potiphar's wife soon uh, look, uh, began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one has more authority than I do. He has held nothing back uh, from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be such a great sin against God. And she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, uh, but he refused to sleep with her and kept out of her way. One day, however, when no one else was around, he went to do his work. She came in, grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away and left his cloak in her hand, and he ran from the house. And the story goes on to tell how she pins this on Joseph. She said, Joseph had come in to rape me. What have you done by bringing this man into my house? And Joseph gets thrown back into jail. And uh, that's the end, uh, you know, as we're looking at chapter 39, uh, in verse 19. It says, Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and he remained there. But get this. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. And so often we imagine that God has disappeared from our lives. He stepped out of our lives. And we're, but I don't think we've ever looked to see that he's right there in the midst of those situations. He hasn't left us. We've just started to doubt. We've just started to make questions about him and why is he allowing us to do this. And, and, and it's, not, it's because we can't see the big picture. And I don't think that Joseph could see the big picture, but that didn't stop him from trusting God. And because he trusted God, because he never gave up, God continued to pour his favor on him, continued to use him in amazing ways and bring him into these positions Janine Keith says that God broke Joseph by taking him out of his comfortable circumstances and stretching him. She says God often has to break us before he can use us. None of us like to be uncomfortable. It's it's almost un-American to be uncomfortable. But sometimes God has got to take us out of those comfort zones, out of those comfortable circumstances, and stretch us to get us to fit the shape of what's coming next. And in Joseph's life, that's exactly what he did. He put him in all of these positions where he had to rely on God. He didn't have any other situation. And I think for us, there's so often the times that we stop relying on God in those situations. But the the story of Joseph, it teaches us that we've got to continue to rely on him because the Lord is right there with us. He wants to use us in all of those situations. As the story goes on and as, as things happen, he's in the, the king's prison. And there are these two guys in the king's prison. Uh, one's a cupbearer. One's a baker. They have, both have dreams. Uh, and Joseph is given the ability to interpret these dreams. One is going to go on and flourish back with the king, and one is going to die. And that is exactly what happens in the story of Joseph. And as the one who's going out back into the king's service, he says, don't forget about me. Don't forget about me. But he does. Joseph continues to stay in prison. And then one day, the pharaoh starts having dreams. And he brings in all of his wisest advisors, all of his magicians, all of his diviners. He pulls all these people in, and he says, what is this dream? And they're like, we have no idea. We have nothing. And the cupbearer remembers, oh yeah, there's a guy in prison who can answer your prayer, your, uh, your dreams. He knows how to answer dreams. He's been given this ability. And so Pharaoh calls Joseph. He tells him what his dreams are. And this is what happens when we pick up in Genesis 41, starting in 25. Joseph responded, both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he's about to do. The seven healthy cows and the seven healthy heads of grain both represent seven years of prosperity. 
The seven thin scrawny cows that came up later and the seven thin heads of grain that withered by the east wind represent seven years of famine. This is what will happen. This will happen just as I've described it. For God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he's about to do. The next seven years will be a period of great prosperity throughout the land of Egypt. But afterward, there will be seven years of famine so great that all the prosperity will be forgotten in Egypt. Famine will destroy the land. The famine will be so severe that even the memory of the good years will be erased. As for having two similar dreams, it means that these events have been decreed by God and he will make them happen soon. Therefore, Pharaoh should find an intelligent man and wise man to put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh should appoint a supervisor over the land to let them collect one-fifth of the crop during the seven good years, have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead to bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses, store it away, and guard it so there will be food in the city. That way there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come on the land. Otherwise, the famine will destroy the land. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh's and officials. So Pharaoh asked, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of these dreams, clearly no one else is intelligent or as wise as you. You will be in charge of my court and all my people will take orders from you. Only I will sit on the throne and will have higher rank than yours. God had used all of these situations in Joseph's life to prepare him for this purpose that he had in store. But it looked nothing like what Joseph thought it was going to look like. Nothing like um, the plans that Joseph had, the purpose that he thought he was there for. And Joseph could have easily tucked himself away in the corner of one of those prison cells in the fetal position, crying and whining about the situations that he was in. Or he could rely on God through everything. And we learn so much from Joseph in that. So much about relying on God no matter what the circumstances are that we're going through. No matter what is going on. And there's a question that comes to mind. And is, are we willing to let God do whatever he needs to do in your life to make you usable to him? So often we think this life and even this question, what on earth am I here for, is about me. It's about my purpose, my goals. You know, I want to climb this ladder. I want to attain this amount of wealth. I want to buy all of these things. This is what I'm here for. These are the goals that I've set forward in my life. But the reality is, is that that's not what we're here for. Joseph was not there to be bowed down and worshiped. That, that there's a part of the story that comes uh, that says why that occurs and, and that happens uh, in the latter part of Genesis. But he was there to fulfill God's purpose. It was only by godly wisdom and godly discernment that that region was spared. That great famine didn't just affect Egypt. It would span way into the other regions of that part of the world, uh, even into uh, Israel. And in, in that time uh, of the seven bad years, uh, Joseph's brothers come down to Egypt because word is spread that they've got plentiful food because they've been storing away preparing for it. And they come down, they have no idea who he is. He's all dressed up in his Egyptian garb. They don't know that it's Joseph. They would have never even thought it was Joseph. And there they come in and like everybody else, they bow down and they ask for food. Joseph recognizes them realizes who they are. He puts them through a series of tests to get his younger brother and his father down into the land so that he can care for them and he can provide for them. The Pharaoh ends up giving them this amazing land of Midian uh, that's just fruitful. It comes from prime Pharaoh real estate. And there the Israelites are set up for what comes next. God was providing for his people in that years of famine so they would begin to trust and lean on him like nothing else. And then Jacob, in his later years, he passes away. And his brothers are so afraid of what he's going to do now that his dad has passed away. He's never once lashed out at them. He's never once thrown them in prison. He's never once tried to kill them for what they did. He's always cared for them. He loved them. He wept when he realized that it was his brothers and his family and his father. And in the end of Genesis, Genesis chapter 50, Joseph tells his brothers, who are so worried, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. And I think there's so many times in our lives, whether it's a person, a boss, a coworker, 
a family member, a situation where we go, that intended me or you intended me for harm. And we stop there. We don't ever look at the bigger picture. We don't ever open our eyes to see maybe God is doing something. Maybe God has risen us into this position. Maybe he's placed us there to teach us a lesson. He says, you intended me for harm, but God intended this all for good. He brought me into this position so I could save the lives of many. And maybe our, our role isn't to prepare for seven bad years of famine, but there's no mistake that God has you where he has you for a reason, and we've got to allow him to use us where we are. Why did he place us in the role that we're in? Why did he place us in the work? Why did he place us in the neighborhood? Why did he place us in these positions? Nicole Eunice says, It's easy for us to fall into a version of Christianity that believes without saying that God is supposed to make our lives go well. That's what we think this is about. God's supposed to make our lives go well. And that is his will for us to get what we want. We have a picture of what our lives are supposed to be. This grandiose picture of how well it's supposed to go for us. And we fall into the rut believing that God's job is to make our picture become a reality. We're so self-centered to think that it's all about us. That this whole thing is about us. That even our purpose is about us. But Joseph's life teaches us that disappointments are vital to the growth. Especially the spiritual growth that's going to occur. Because these situations demand faith and and resting all of our hope in God. Just like Joseph. God takes us through these situations But the end of the story isn't about Joseph. The end of the story is about God. God preserving his people. God creating a plan for the famine to bring glory to God. There was no one else in Egypt, nobody, that had the wisdom to save them but God. God used Joseph. The story of Joseph is so much like so many other stories in the overarching story of the Bible. What we learn is, is that God uses humanity to bring about his purposes and his glory. Like you and I are the hands and the feet of God to be used by God. That's what we're here for. That, that's our, our purpose, is to be used by God. And God's going to use our lives and use our situations. And he's going to put us in places that we don't really expect to teach us and to grow us and to stretch us so that he could use us for his glory. And oftentimes, it's very uncomfortable. And it pulls us out of our comfort zones. And it's in the places that we, we don't like. I, I've shared my story a number of times with you guys. You know, from 2008 to 2010, I had stepped out of ministry and I, and I worked at Chick-fil-A, right? I, I, I applied for so many different jobs, like jobs that, you know, these are easy jobs. Go work in a warehouse. You know, the box comes in, you take the box, you put it on a shelf, somebody orders something, you come, you pull something out of that box, put it in another box and you ship it off. Like, not that hard. I can do a warehouse job didn't get the warehouse job, right? Go down all these things. Finally, I get hired by Chick-fil-A. And I started at the bottom, right? The bottom. So the bottom is the place underneath the sink where they keep all the chicken pans. These dirty, grimy hours of sitting out chicken. And you know what happens when you get a little bit of chicken and a little bit of flour and you leave it out for hours? It's harder than cement. It, it, like it's harder than cement. You're wearing, you're, you're scrubbing down the pan so much that you hope you don't get through to the other side to get to metal, right? I mean, like this is the nastiest job and I struggled with God. What on earth am I doing scrubbing chicken pans and scrubbing floors for months and months on end, trying to figure out what God had in store for me? Like, God, look, I I, I devoted my life to you. I, I went to Bible college for you. I got this degree for you. I've sacrificed for you. And here I am at the very, very bottom. Didn't stay that way. I worked my butt off. I got a lot of encouragement from my wife and and, and just try to change the whole perspective around. I wasn't working for this, this guy who, who said he was a Christian but didn't act like a Christian. I, I was working for God. And when I could get that into my mind and I remember the day clear as any other picture in my head, everything began to change. I got out of that fetal position and I stopped whining about my situation 
And I started doing what God had called me to do. And, and God opened doors to where I became a team leader. And then I began to lead the kitchen. And then I began to do some management things. And then I got into some more management roles. And I became the evening manager and the assistant manager. So I was the second guy in charge under the general manager. And I, I still didn't know, like, God, why are you doing this? Why did you lead me through the, all of this? What am I here for? Why is this? And, uh, and God opened a door for us to get back into ministry. And we went to Ohio. And we served in a great church that just did ministry just different than we thought ministry should be done. A bunch of wonderful people. Uh, but just it wasn't what God had called us to do. And I think he used that, that time to open our eyes to a lot of things. And eventually he opened the door and we're like, all right, God, we're going to take what we learned. We're going to come down to St. Augustine. We're going to help uh, this church that you've called us to serve. And nine months later, God said, hey, I got this other thing for you. It's going to be great and you're really going to like it. Why don't you be the lead guy in the church? And I'm like, <laughs> funny story, God, it is no. And he didn't, he, he said, you know what, I, I use, I put you in this position to learn how to work with people put you in this position to learn how to, to run things. I, I showed you all of these things, and, I, and I've, I've opened your eyes to these different ways so that you could lead your church. And I knew what God had called me to do, and, and we, you know, we walked into this position, and, and it's been an amazing run. Uh, four years, four years ago, we, we stepped into Homeport. Three years ago, literally three years ago, we stepped into this role the end of July 2014, uh, not knowing what God had in store for us, but, but faithful to what he called us to. The life of Joseph shows us so much about what our purpose is. Paul begins to explain that purpose, that overarching story of the Bible where it talks, it's just not about us, this is about God. He explains it to the Corinthians when he writes to the, uh, the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says this, either way, God, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have died to our old life. He died for everyone so that all who receive a new life no longer live for themselves. Key in on that. You receive this new life. You no longer live for yourself. Instead, they will live for Christ. Why? Because he died and he was raised for them. God invites us. He gives us invitation into the new family of Christ. He gives us this new opportunity to shed all of our old ways and an opportunity to stop living for ourselves because when we're honest with ourselves, these plans, these purposes, these pinnacles that we've set for ourselves, when we reach them, we still feel empty. We still feel unfulfilled. We're not satisfied. Because the purpose of our life is so much bigger than the things that we can fill in with. Our finite minds are incapable of filling a hole that only God can fill. And so God says... He's done all of this for us. So instead of living for ourselves, we make this decision to live for Jesus. He says, so we've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. We're learning how to live in a new life that has begun. And all of this is a gift from God. Think about that. All of this is a gift from God. This, we are not deserving a new life. There's nothing that we've done that would say, hey, you deserve a new life. Yet he offers us this amazing new life. And it's a gift from him who's bringing him back to, our, to himself through Christ. And God has given us this. He's giving us a task. Three times in the New Testament, there are tasks given to the church. The church is the people that make up. It's not the building here. This isn't a church. This is a building. Three times God has given the body of Christ, the church, a task. Matthew chapter 28, he says, go into all nations and make disciples. Same, same time period, different conversation. Acts chapter 1, he says, you are going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, this is your task. 
God has given us a task of reconciling people to him. This is what we are here for. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. He has given us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. This is what we are here for. For God made Christ who never sinned to be our offering for sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Just like Joseph's purpose was to fulfill God's role, what God had in store for him, our role, our purpose, our identity is found only in living for Christ and becoming reconcilers for the world. Now, there's going to be all kinds of amazing things that occur because we are inside of God's will, because we're doing the thing that God has called us to do. We're doing it in our work. We're doing it in our schools. We're doing it in our homes and in our neighborhoods and in the lives of the people around us. Just like Joseph, God was right there. He was showing him favor. Every step of the way, God was showing him favor because he trusted him and he did what he called him to do. And when we do the same thing, God is right there calling us and showing us favor because we have done the thing that we've called, been called to do. We have been Jesus' hands and feet. We've used not only our lives but our words to reconcile the world, to call them back to God, the God who formed them together in the womb. This is our role. Our purpose is to be Christ's ambassadors. Your purpose is to live for Jesus. That, that's your purpose. I want you guys to write that down this morning. Your purpose is to live for Jesus. Now, you probably didn't think that, that when we were talking about purpose that that was what we were going to get to. That was not the conclusion of that question that you were asking this morning. What is my purpose? But it is the ultimate purpose in this life. Because there's so much that comes from living inside of God's purpose. So much that's going to come. So many blessings. So many opportunities from the places that God puts us. We're not in these places um, just because. We're not in them as a punishment. But we're in these places because this is where God wants us. It's no mistake that you are where you are. And even if it is, there's a purpose behind it. God can make all things good for those that love him. I mean, this is, this is the reason that we are here. Our purpose is far greater than the job that we'll work. It's far greater than the city that we're going to live in. Purpose and identity are, are, are intermixed in our, in our language and our vocabulary. Our identity is more than who we are married to or the school that we get our, our education from. Our identity and ultimately our purpose is found in Jesus and Jesus alone Church, this is what we are here for. This is why we exist. And if we're not finding satisfaction, we're not finding contentment, we're not finding purpose, it's because we're looking in the wrong place. That this is what this is why we are here. Now, there are times when we are uh, seeking for a specific direction, all of life is not generalities. It's not like, you know, we're just on this one road. It's going to go forever. There are times when we're given opportunities. Maybe it's a specific job. It's maybe where we're supposed to go next. Maybe we're asking the question, am I supposed to marry this person? Maybe we're asking, is it the right time to? And you fill in the blank with what's going on in your life. Uh, there are times where we're speaking specific or specific uh, direction. And this is where we, we've, we tend to place our understanding and where we need to look at uh, God's greater will and, and purpose for our lives. You've been given a free will. You've been given plenty of opportunities to enjoy life and to make decisions inside of a, uh, uh, for yourself. But we make those decisions inside of, of God's guardrails. When we were up in the mountains a couple weeks ago, um, whenever we would get onto like, you know, we were driving next to a creek, but the creek was like 20 yards, you know, 20 feet below the road, or we were on the side of a mountain, and if the kid, you know, whoever, which kid was on that side of the car, they'd always make mention of the guardrail. Like either it was there or it was not there. 
And if it wasn't there, they'd freak out, right? I mean, like, you do not want to go off the side of the road. They're like, there's no guardrail. I'm like, yeah, 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 there's trees. They'll catch us before we tumble all the way down the mountain. Like, this is going to be all right, you know? But, but that's our, our life is to be lived inside of these guardrails that God has put us in front of us. How do we live our lives? How do we do the things that, that God has called us to do? And sometimes we're asking questions as we're going through this life. One of the things, uh, ways that we can find uh, out about specific direction is to seek godly input. Proverbs chapter 11 says, For the lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. And so you're, you're looking at what's next. You're asking questions about what to do, a job opportunity. Are you supposed to move? Are you asking the godly people around you? Maybe somebody who's further down the road, somebody who you're walking down that road with. Are you asking them these questions? Hey, what do you think? And are you open to honest answers about it? I was reading a guy who was talking about asking a friend about this specific guidance. And he says, uh, do you want an honest, he goes, I want your honest opinion. And the guy says, do you want an honest opinion or do you want an honest opinion, right? And the guy's like, no, 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 I want an honest opinion. He's like, I know you want an honest opinion, but do you really want an honest opinion? Or do you really just want me to agree with you and say this is a good idea and not push back any? And finally, the guy's like, I get it, I get it. I, I really want your honest opinion, And so we go to these godly friends and these godly advisors and mentors and we ask them, but we want to know honestly, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? Do you really think God could be taking me down this path? Someone who knows you, someone who's walked with you and and, and can really help you in those situations. We we seek for, for godly input. Um, you know, when we're in a certain situation. Too often we realize, or we forget to realize, the reason that we, we've been put there. And as we're seeking godly input, maybe God is calling us into a new direction. Maybe God's calling us into a new job. Uh, the reason that, that we, we get so much uh, favor, the reason we've been called into those things and God has sent us in as his ambassadors is because there's certain things that only Christians can bring into a situation. When we look at the life of of Joseph, only Joseph could bring godly wisdom and direction into that. As a Christian, you are bringing godly wisdom and direction into that next venture, into that next job opportunity, into that neighborhood. One of the things that's seriously lacking in the world around us uh, is a moral compass. For us, the Christian, we have a moral compass. We know where true north is. We bring a moral compass into those situations. We know how God has called us to live. We know the things that he's called us to do. We know what's right and what's wrong. And so as we're seeking guidance into going into these situations, not only are we we looking for God's will, but what can we, why is God bringing us into? What do we offer that no one else in that situation offers? So we seek godly input. Another thing that we've got to do is we've got to pay attention to how God has, has wired you. How has God wired you? 1 Peter chapter 4 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. How has God wired you? What gifting has he given you? What personality has he given you? And when you go into that situation... Is that what you're using? You know, God, or a lot of times we say any open door is God's open door. And that's not often true. There are lots of opportunities and open doors. We've got to use the godly wisdom we've been given to walk into them or not walk into them, to not take them. And sometimes we walk in and we think, oh, I could be great at this. And we talk ourselves up a big game, but we're not gifted. We don't have the right personality for it. And so it wouldn't be the right door for us to walk through. So each, you know, and we've got to take these kinds of things into consideration when we're looking for specific direction or are we asking for godly input and are we, excuse me, are we going down uh, paths based on our passions, our giftings, our talents, you know, how God has wired us. You know, a lot of times you get people to come and they'll ask you, you know, what am I supposed to do? One One of my favorite things to ask you is what are you passionate about? Is this what you're passionate about? Maybe if it's what you're passionate about, maybe it is a door, an open door for you. Maybe that is supposed to be the direction you're going. But oftentimes, uh, our, our passions don't always equal full-time jobs and careers. And so our passions get lived out on the side. 
I have a buddy who is uh, an amazing um, database engineer. I mean, like, amazing. He gets it on levels that I've never seen, like, understands. He is a contractor uh, for the DOD. Um, you know, he works in buildings like the NSA building and, uh, you know, the Pentagon. He goes in and he helps them with their databases. He could care less. It's a job that pays him. He gets to accrue time off. But his passion is taking students on mission trips. And so he, he gathers a group of students together who are interested in missions. And he teaches them about missions for the year. And they work literally for a year. They'll work together and they'll pull together a plan. And then he accrues all of this time off because he can work longer hours some days to get more hours off because as long as he gets his job done. And so he goes off for like two weeks every summer. And he takes these mission trips. This year he went to, uh, to Italy and he ran a camp, a sports camp in Italy where they got to proclaim the gospel. Uh, and, you know, but that's his passion. But his passion doesn't line up with his career. But he uses his career to fulfill his passion. And so often we're, we've got to ask ourselves, what am I passionate about? What am I gifted at? What are my, my talents? And even if I can't make money at it, How can I still accomplish that? Because each of us is given a gift and we've received these gifts so we can serve others. I want to close uh, with a prayer that I found written by Thomas Merton. And this is what it says this morning. It says, Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I may not see the road ahead of me, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I'm following your will doesn't mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I will never do anything apart from your desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will always trust you. Though I may seem to be lost in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are forever with me. And you will never leave me to face my struggles alone. Joseph found out how true that was. That God was never too far from him. That it wasn't God, uh, it wasn't man who was directing his path, but it was God who was directing his path. And that though he seemed lost in those prison cells for years, God was forever with him. And the same is true for us. Whatever we're going through, whatever struggles we're, we're trying, or that we're being tried by, while we're looking for our purpose. But we're asking this question, what on earth am I here for? Why am I in this job? Why am I in this neighborhood? Why am I doing this? God is always right beside us. The call is to live for Jesus and to let God put the things into place. Why don't you guys pray with me this morning? Father God, as we sit and look at the story of Joseph, how much we're reminded that you walked right with him through it all. That, it, that you were right there with him, guiding and directing him, even in his hardest moments, even in the darkest uh, cells of those prisons, you were right there. And, and if you were right there for Joseph, your word says you're going to be right there for us, that you're going to walk along our dark nights and our hard paths. Father, you've called us to live for Christ. You've given us this this amazing gift of reconciliation, one that we don't deserve. Father, I pray that you would help us, just like Joseph, to live for you. And that in those moments, in those, those, those times, that you would continue to bless us and continue to open our eyes to how you want to use us. That we would find our purpose in you and you alone. That it's you are our satisfaction. That you are our fulfillment. Father, we trust in this. And we we praise you in these times. Father, today as we come, I pray that you would just be with us. As we're in these moments, I pray that you would use this quiet, still time to speak to us and to be with us. Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.